So learning objective three is about ratio analysis. This is uh, a, the biggest part of your project that's coming up. Um, and so that's really, really important. Uh, ratio analysis is a summary of all the ratios we've been doing since chapter two. You go way back from chapter two to what we just looked at in chapter uh, 12. We were introduced to ratios all that time. Um, there's no new ratios, I believe. It's all just a summary of all the ones you've already seen in Accounting 101 and 102. So uh, it should sort of ring a bell a little bit. We have to go way back to chapter two to remember we had the price earnings ratio. Okay. So the PE ratio is simply the, uh, the price of a share of stock uh, compared to the earnings per share. Okay. And that gives you a PE ratio. It's basically, you know, what investors are willing to pay for um, a multiple of the earnings that the company has. Most uh, frequently, a high PE ratio can mean that investors believe the future of the company is more profitable. Um, sometimes it doesn't mean that, <laughs> but sometimes it can mean that the future uh, looks good and so people are willing to pay a higher price to become owners of a share of stock. Um, but it's not, uh, it's not a be all end all, it's one ratio in a series of ratios that we look at to analyze how a company is doing. So um, you probably remember the price earnings ratio and that's the first one. Um, when you look at the price earnings ratio, uh, as long as you have two of the three numbers here, you can calculate uh, for the most part. So here we have Southwest Airlines. It has a dollar and 65 cents uh, in earnings per share. Okay. It has a price earnings ratio of 19.5. Right. So the stock price is 19.5 times the earnings. Okay. Higher than the earnings. Uh, now, 1920, that's actually, you know, these are relatively normal uh, PE ratios between 15 and 20, 25. Uh, anything above 25 represents a, um, basically investor confidence that perhaps the stock is going to move higher because the profitability of the company looks good. Uh, sometimes that does uh, happen. Uh, it could also mean that perhaps a high PE ratio could also mean that perhaps the stock price is too high <laughs> because um, maybe it's not going to be that profitable and people are simply bidding up the price of the stock. So it's, we call it overvalued and, uh, and thus it can, it can be a warning if there's no profitability, if there's no future outlook that things are looking really great. It can be a warning sign have a high PE. Probably remember a whole bunch of liquidity ratios that we've done over the course of this, um, the last year. Uh, way back in chapter two, you remember we did the current ratio and working capital. Current ratio and working capital deal with current assets and current liabilities. The working capital is simply subtracting the difference between the two numbers. And the current ratio is the ratio of current assets to current liabilities. Um, so this we looked at, again, it's you pay bills with your current assets. Remember, current liabilities are bills that need to be paid within the year. Your current assets are probably gonna be turned into cash within a year. So that ratio gives you an idea of, does the company have enough access to cash to pay its bills? And that's really what liquidity is, is really about. We also looked in chapter five and six, uh, mostly chapter six, about 
inventory. How quickly are they selling their inventory? Uh, the inventory turnover ratio tells us how many times per year uh, the store is selling out its inventory and restocking. Um, and that's important because inventory is a current asset that needs to be turned into cash. When you sell it, it turns into cash. So the quicker you sell your inventory, the quicker you're going to get your cash, which is why it's part of the liquidity ratios, because inventory eventually will be turned into cash. We also, once we know the inventory turnover rate, we put that under 365 to get the days in inventory, okay? Um, and again, we're hoping to sell our inventory as quickly as possible, particularly if we're a lower priced company, uh, like Walmart, you want a very high turnover ratio. So the number of days will be quite short. However, when you have a more luxury item, a much higher priced item, um, you're gonna have a slower or a smaller inventory turnover ratio, and you're gonna be keeping that inventory a little bit longer. Um, that's normal, that happens, that does happen. But again, the reason the inventory is in your liquidity is because it will be turned into cash. Also, when we looked at chapter uh, eight, we looked at accounts receivable. Right? And remember what accounts receivable is, is you're waiting to receive your cash. You've already performed a service, you've already delivered a good or a product, and you're waiting to get paid for that. So accounts receivable will turn into cash, which is why it's a liquidity ratio as well. The accounts receivable turnover tells us how many times per year we are collecting our receivables. And as you know, most receivables are a 30-day waiting process. And the average month has 30 days. So we should be collecting our receivables at least 12 times per year. Um, and so we're looking for 12 or higher to evaluate as good liquidity, very good liquidity. Uh, if it's below 12, then that might hurt liquidity because they're not collecting their cash uh, as quickly as they need to. Once we know the turnover uh, rate for accounts receivable, we can put that under 365 to get the collection period. How many days are we actually collecting? So look how the turnover rate, both for inventory and accounts receivable, becomes the first thing you do. Then you put it under 365 to calculate the period in days, okay? Um, so again, go way back. This is a chapter two uh, issue. Okay? Um, inventory, we talked about inventory. Chapter six was the inventory turnover and days in turnover. And uh, we did this in chapter eight when we talked about receivables. So in terms of information, this is nothing new. We've already seen these, but now we've categorized those as all liquidity ratios that we're gonna be using to evaluate a company. Okay. Um, solvency ratios, as you know, talk about the ability for a company to manage its, its long-term debt. Okay, oops. And so there are, um, a few solvency ratios that we have looked at uh, over time as well. Um, if you can remember way back in chapter two, we did look at the uh, debt to asset ratio, which simply compares the total debt of the company, which is total liabilities, to the total assets of the company. Right, and that gives you that ratio, and it tells you how much, how reliant they are on debt to buy their assets. Okay, some companies are very high, they might have a 60, 70, 80 percent uh, debt to asset ratio, which means they're borrowing a lot to buy their assets. Some companies have you know 50 percent, 40 percent debt to asset ratio which means they're not borrowing a lot of money to buy their assets. So either way, it's a solvency ratio 
uh, even companies that have a very high debt to asset ratio might be able to handle their debt quite well. Still might be able to handle their debt quite well. Uh, and you saw this in chapter 10, we looked at liabilities. You also saw times interest earned, right? So the number, basically the times interest earns is how many times the profit of the company covers the interest expense on the debt, okay, that it has. So the formula, as you remember, the net income plus the interest expense plus income tax expense divided by the interest expense gives you this times interest earned. But if you wanted to abbreviate it, what we're really looking at is how many times over can, is the company's profit able to pay the interest on its debt? Uh, the higher that number, the easier it is for the company to manage its debt. And if you probably went back to chapter 10 and looked at General Motors, they had a very high debt to asset ratio. It was like 80% which is really, really high for a company to rely that on that much debt. But their times interest earned was like 11 times. So their profit was 11 times more than their interest expense. So that was easy for them to do. Yes, they have a lot of debt, but they're clearly capable of handling that uh, debt at this, at this time. Another thing that looks, uh, another ratio that looks at solvency we learned in the very last chapter with the free cash flow, okay? Uh, free cash flow is that net cash provided by operating activities minus the capital expenditures. Remember, we're only looking at uh, property, plant, and equipment. Capital expenditures are specific to fixed assets, property, plant, and equipment, minus any cash dividends. The difference technically is free cash flow. And the company should be able to have a significant amount of cash flowing in from their operating activities to cover all of these and give them still a cushion that uh, helps a lot in terms of their, their solvency. The last types of ratios we looked at way early on was the profitability ratios, right? Stockholders, the owners of the company wanna make sure the company is profitable. And so there's a bunch of ratios that sort of measure the profitability of a company. Now we've already gone over the price earnings ratio earlier. So we're gonna leave that as something that we've already done. Uh, we have looked at earnings per share. This is also back in chapter two when we looked at this. Earnings per share basically is the profit of the company divided by the average common shareholders. Uh, in very most cases, 92% of companies do not have preferred stock, so they do not pay preferred dividends. So 92% of the time, that number is going to be zero. <clears throat> there are some companies, corporations that do have preferred stock, uh, but like I said, there are very few around, so they will have some preferred dividends to subtract out of their profits. But in essence, it's the profit of the company divided by the weighted shares outstanding earnings per share. How much of the profit is divided per share? Because corporations are broken into shares of ownership. So per share of ownership, how much is the profit? That's important. Uh, another thing we looked at way back in chapter five, when we looked at the multi-step income statement, uh, we looked at two very important rates. One is called the gross profit rate, which tells you, right, their, um, the percentage, the gross profit to the net sales. We clearly want to have a gross profit rate that is as high as possible. As you saw, some companies have a relatively low gross profit rate, um, 30%, 35% or so. Some companies have a high gross profit rate, 40% up and up. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean they're, they're keeping all of that. We saw that when we looked at the exporting goods compared to REI way back in chapter five. REI was had a much higher gross profit rate um, than the exporting goods. However, 
um, that didn't trickle down into the profit margin, which is how much net income they kept. What was their profit on their net sales? <clears throat> um, so what we saw is Dick's Sporting Goods was looked weak for gross profit rate, but was killing it for profit margin. And REI, which looked like it was killing it for gross profit rate, ended up sort of looking really weak when it came to profit margin because they weren't keeping more than two cents out of a dollar. Um, so this is important to, these are very, very important profitability ratios because what you keep from your revenue is important to stockholders, to owners. That's their profits. That's their profits. Some other profitability ratios came um, when we looked at fixed assets in chapter nine. Uh, we looked at return on assets. So based on the total assets of the company, uh, how profitable was that? That's the return on their assets. So it's the profits of the company compared to the average total assets. And you know that the reason people, uh, companies have assets is to make sales and to make profits. And so this return on asset looks at the profits that the total assets are generating in a form of a ratio. The asset turnover is using your assets to generate sales. And so what you have is the sales of the company compared to the average total assets, that same number. Um, because again, the purpose of having all types of assets is to generate sales. There's no other reason really to have all that property, plant and equipment. So this we have to uh, look back at chapter nine to make sure we understood this uh, a little bit better. Another thing that we look at or stockholders look at is the payout ratio and the return on their equity. So first things first, the payout ratio is simply the dividend that's being paid to them from the net income, right? So how much of the net income is being shared as a dividend? That's the percentage, right? So that's basically the payout ratio. Um, it's important because it's based on the profitability of the company. And the return on common stockholders equity is basically you have common stockholders equity listed on the balance sheet. And they wanna compare that to the profitability of the company. Again, minus preferred dividends, like I said, 92% of the time, that's gonna be zero. So most of it is looking at the profit of the company divided by the average stockholders equity that gives them a return. For this, we had to look in chapter 11 for these ratios that we've already done, okay. So those are the overviews of all of that. Learning Objective 4, which we're really not, we're kind of using it more as a, a show and tell. Um, there's actually no homework on it, but the ratio analysis is gonna be very similar to this. So it's worthwhile to sort of go through how to evaluate a company, comprehensively using the analysis, ratio analysis. And this is part of what you're gonna be doing anyway. Um, again, you're looking at uh, company to company um, or, or inside the company from one year to the other, company to company, right? Within the same industry and company to industry. Different ways to compare how they're doing. So here we look at, uh, this is Chicago Serial, um, all stuff that we've seen earlier in this particular chapter, their comparative balance sheets uh, is listed here. Um, the income statements um, comparatively, so from 2013 to 14 is listed here. <clears throat> and their cash flow statement uh, for 2020. 13, 2014 is listed here. So notice that you need your financial statements to do analysis. That's why it was so important for the last year to make sure you understood those financial statements very, very well. Uh, particularly that income statement and balance sheet um, are critically important for analysis. 
and you just learned about the cash flow statement, which again, we use partly as well here. So again, the, the full gamut of ratio analysis is everything, liquidity ratios, solvency ratios, profitability ratios, all the ones that you've already looked at, we do, okay? So uh, current ratios, as you know, current assets, current liabilities. For Chicago Serial, when you look at its current assets compared to its current liabilities, their current ratio is 0. 0.67 to one in 2014 but that's the same as General Mills. That's really, really low, right? We wanna see this well over a dollar, um, you know, close to two to one. So that means, uh, again, as, as the book explains, it has about 67 cents of assets for every dollar of current liabilities. So this is a very, very low um, liquidity ratio. It's not very good, you know, in general. Accounts receivable turnover, again, how many times per year are they able to sell, I'm sorry, they're able to collect uh, money that's owed to them, uh, the formula, uh, the credit sales over the average net receivables for Chicago, 11.9, for General Mills, 12, for the industry, 11.2. So clearly, Chicago cereal is doing better than the industry, which is very good. Uh, and clearly it's similar to General Mills, but General Mills is doing a better job than all of them. Uh, Chicago cereal went from 12 to 11.9. It's similar, but it's slower. That means they're collecting their cash more slowly from 2013, 2014. Uh, even though it's better than the industry, it's more slowly than last year and it's slower than General Mills. So how does it compare when you do an analysis? <laughs> it's just what I mentioned. Uh, a little bit more slowly, uh, slowly than General Mills, but higher than the industry. <laughs> Their average collection period is the uh, accounts receivable divided into days, right? So once you have that turnover ratio, put it under 365. Here for Chicago, it's 30.7 days. For General Mills, 29.9. For the industry, 32 days. Um, so 30.7 days, a little bit longer than 30.4 days. So again, they're waiting a little bit longer to get their cash. Certainly, General Mills is doing really well. They're getting paid within that 30-day period because it's less than 30. So they're collecting their cash on time, if not a little bit sooner. Chicago Cereals collecting its cash a little bit late. Okay, but still, both of those are better than the industry. Okay, all cereal uh, companies are are not doing very well. Maybe they need a different breakfast. Uh, you know, I'm not really sure. But again, um, that's the general goal. You don't want it uh, your collection period to to exceed what your terms are. And if your terms are net thirty, you're gonna get paid in thirty days. The inventory turnover, uh, again, the cost of goods sold divided by average inventory. Uh, here for Chicago cereal in 2014, that was seven and a half times per year. Okay, so that inventory rate looks good. For General Mills, 7.4, and for the industry, 6.7. So 7.5 is a really high turnover rate. It's very similar to the General Mills, a little bit faster in getting rid of their inventory and much faster than the industry at 6.7. However, when you compare Chicago Sierra, what they were doing the previous year to what they're doing in this most recent year, it's slowed down. The inventory is slowing down in terms of getting, getting turned over. So how does it compare to General Mills? Slightly faster, slightly faster. When you turn that into the number of days, uh, here Chicago's at 48. Uh, 0.7 days, General Mill 49.3 days compared to 54 and a half days. That's how quickly they are turning around their inventory. They're selling out their inventory every 48 days compared to General Mill's 49 days. They're a little ahead of the curve there. The industry isn't selling out there until every 54 days. So they're doing much better than the industry and better than General Mills by a day. 
for the solvency, again, this is the ability to, to pay debt, long-term debts for the most part. Um, and when you're looking at debt to asset or interest times, you're looking for total liabilities and total assets. So you're looking at your balance sheet here. Um, here's where, I mean, Chicago cereal for 2014, 78% debt to asset ratio uh, compared to 55% for General Mills and the industry. So clearly this company relies very heavy on debt in purchasing its assets. So we call that a lot of leverage. They are, they are leveraged much higher than the industry and for General Mills, which means they rely on debt more. Uh, good news within the company is it's that ratio has gone down a little bit. So they're slightly less leveraged than they were in 2013, but they certainly are carrying a lot more debt burden than General Mills and the industry. But again, the fact that they went from 81% to 78% means they slightly improved their debt to asset ratio inside the company. Times interest earned, again, how many times does their profit cover the amount of interest expense uh, that they have? Uh, it indicates the ability to meet those payments as they come due. For, for Chicago Cereal in 2014, 5.8. So their profit was almost six times as high as their interest expense. So that's, that's better than the industry. So they're doing okay. But General Mills clearly has less worries in servicing its debt because their profits are almost 10 times higher than their interest payments. Uh, so clearly... So is Chicago able to service its debt pretty well? Yeah, yeah. Uh, 5.8 is, is good, uh, much higher than the industry. Um, and again, um, it, it just, again, indicates that their profit is able to cover their interest expense 5.8 times over. Uh, free cash flow, free cash flow. So again, your net cash provided by operating activities. So your capital expenditures and your cash dividends. So you're gonna be looking on the cash flow statement for this information. Uh, net cash, capital expenditures, again, just property, plant and equipment and cash dividends are listed here. So the free cash flow for, for Chicago cereal, 556,000, that's higher than it was in 2013. So that's, that's quite good. For uh, for General Mills, it's uh, 890, almost 900 million dollars. Uh, so that's actually quite good. Can't compare to the industry. Uh, there's no industry standard. So their cash provided by operations was more than enough uh, to give them a lot of extra money to do other things. So um, some other profitability ratios: uh, the return on common stockholders' equity. This shows you, again, net income minus preferred dividends, which is zero most of the time, uh, divided by the average common stockholders equity. So the return on stockholders equity for Chicago cereal was 48%. That's outstanding return for common stockholders equity. General Mills, 25%, nothing to sneeze at. That's a good return as well, but 48 is phenomenal compared to the industry at 19. So they're, they're, they're doing really well by the shareholders, right? They're really providing a huge return on, on their shareholders. Like this is, it's unusually high, um, but I'd say it's, it's just, it's great. It's like hitting a grand slam. I'll take it. Um, return on assets, again, your net income divided by your average total assets. So you need your income statement to get your profit. You need your comparative balance sheets to total average your total assets. 10% return on assets for Chicago cereal compared to 6.2% for General Mills compared to 5% for the industry. So they're doing exceptionally well in terms of generating profits from their average assets. Very, very good. Okay. Their profit margin, again, you need to look at your income statement, your net income compared to your net sales. Um, for Chicago cereal in 2014, 9%. That's really high. They're keeping nine cents out of every dollar they sell. That's really good. 
General Mills, nothing not too shabby, eight cents on every dollar. Uh, much, much higher than the industry and slightly better than, than General Mills. So they're doing, uh, they're doing really, really well with their profit margins. Okay. Uh, asset turnover, their net sales, which is on the income statement, divided by average total assets, which is on your balance sheet. That's part of the pro that's part of the issue in doing ratio analysis is you need to know where to find these numbers, right? But once you know where to find them, I think it's, it works quite well. So the asset turnover rate for Chicago cereal is 1.07. I mean, it's really exceptionally high. General Mills, 76, 0.76 for the industry, 0.87. So the, the Chicago cereal is using their assets exceptionally well because they're generating more than 100% of their assets in terms of sales. A dollar and seven cents in sales for every dollar in average assets. Compare that to 76 cents in sales for every dollar in average assets uh, or 87 cents in sales for every dollar of average assets. So they're just killing it here. They're just really killing it. They're using their assets exceptionally well, exceptionally well. Um, when you look at profit margin or you look at asset turnover ratio, uh, again, overwhelmingly, uh, this company is, the company is doing very, very well. <clears throat> the gross profit rate, the gross profit divided over the net sales. Um, Again, their gross profit is significantly higher than both General Mills and the industry. So they have a very high gross profit margin, which should help them, and it has, it has. Earnings per share is their net income divided by their average shares outstanding. Um, well, I mean, this is much better to look at in, in, inside the company from year to year compared to company to company. So, you know, it's really not something that you can really look at across the industry per se, because General Mills is a multi-billion dollar company versus a multi-million dollar company. So uh, is 290 much better than 263? You really can't compare in that regard. It's interesting though, but they're, they're doing well. You can't compare Chicago from last year to this current year. Uh, and there, they're doing much, much better. Uh, they've increased their earnings per share, which is what you want to see. But this is usually just good within the company. Uh, PE ratio is something you can compare industry-wide. Um, the price of the share of stock compared to the earnings per share. For Chicago, it's 20 times earnings, which is very reasonable. For General Mills, 24, again, quite reasonable. Uh, the industry is a little out of whack. Almost 36 uh, is cereal that that much more profitable. Um, I'm not sure, but in essence, the P ratios are within a normal range. Within 15 to 25 is a normal range for most companies that are trading on the exchanges. A higher than that would mean high growth. Uh, I'm not sure people are eating that much cereal. <laughs> Payout ratio, again, the cash dividend compared to the net income. How much of the net income are they sharing with owners? Um, Chicago cereal at 43%, General Mills at 54% versus an industry of 37%. Again, it, it's, it's interesting to know the payout ratio, but you really want it to be sustainable. So General Mills and, well, General Mills is giving more than half of their profit back to their stockholders. Um, that, that seems high to me. Um, for Chicago cereal, I mean, 40, 45% is also relatively high, but is this more sustainable? Sure. sure. And that is what an analysis would look like. Uh, can we go back to the uh, one uh, before the uh, Pierce earnings, price earnings? Okay. 